Green and has been working a lot coming up with latest and greatest uh, technology. Thinking about uh, the sensors and the intelligence that comes with, with that, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the importance of AI. Like a smartphone maker, consider how much interpretation is done at the edge versus how much shall be done in the cloud. Welcome everyone to the Voice of Innovation Fireside Chat. My name is Bram Geene, I'm CEO of Revolver, and we're hosting these conversations together with Sintians, and they're exploring the future of pervasive AI and the work of the innovators and engineers that are making that future possible. So today, Kurt Busch, the CEO of Sintient, is gonna have a conversation with Andreas Urschitz, who is the division president for power and sensor systems at Infineon. And Infineon is of course, one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world. This is gonna be an interesting conversation, lots of topics to talk about. So I wanna hand it over to Kurt, ask you to introduce yourself and also tell why it's interesting for you to talk with uh, Andreas and Sintient about these innovations. Thank you, Bram. Uh, my name is Kurt Bush and I'm founder and CEO of Sintient. We are building ultra low power deep learning solutions to bring the, the power of AI into edge devices. Today, AI is really something you typically go to the cloud. And our, our belief is that for people to benefit from the power of, of artificial intelligence and specifically deep learning, it needs to be pervasive in any type of device from, from things that are you know, today very much dominated by microcontrollers, but they could be in anything from laptops to cell phones, to earbuds, to, to even greeting cards. And, and I'm quite excited here to be working with, with Infineon today is that we have a, a long relationship with Infineon and, and often the Infineon sensors, uh, which seem to be some of the best in the world. So, so, you know, very exciting there is that they're often right next to the, the sentient devices. So if the sentient device is, is doing the machine learning, very often it's connected to an Infineon sensor. So I'm really excited to be talking to Andreas today. Andreas, you previously shared with me that you grew up in a farm, and I, I was quite interested in in how you went from from being a, a farmer in Austria to to one of the leaders in the semiconductor industry. So, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. You know, growing up on a farm, uh, in particular in Austria, which was uh, in the middle of the Alps, I always got fascinated by technology, uh, even as a kid. So, we used to have a couple of tractors. And when I was like uh, seven or eight years old, I was already driving these uh, machines and uh, was uh, fascinated by how it works and was always uh, teasing my father like, hey, come on, we need to buy a bigger one and we need to buy a better one. And, and, and that, that kind of then also had an impact on me and formed me uh, to a certain way uh, in, in, in terms of uh, always striving for uh, getting better technology to work more meaningful on the farm. The other topic was uh, growing up on a farm uh, to me, uh, was very much confronting me with uh, environmental changes, if you will. So we used to have uh, our own forest. And uh, when you're once in your forest and see how trees are dying because of climate change, it does something to you. And uh, these two elements, if you will, fascination by technology and uh, uh, sort of uh, then also seeing and watching how climate is changing, um, having that in the back of my mind uh, and then being confronted with the opportunity to work for a high-tech company, Infineon, I thought that's an opportunity to really make an impact, impact on technology and making use of technology in order to make the world a bit greener. Just to jump in on that, um, one, one thing uh, that you've already mentioned uh, in, in, in the pre-conversation is that uh, a big focus of yours is like building, rebuilding the five senses in the form of semiconductors. And I'm, I'm very curious um, in, in to what level AI comes into play into that. Now, Infineon is pursuing its vision of emulating the five human senses, eventually even the sixth human sense, uh, into each and every kind of electronics. But uh, in order to uh, make electronics uh, understand uh, in a meaningful and without latency, uh, way of uh, understanding, uh, for instance, voice uh, through a microphone and interpret uh, a specific uh, command uh, or to make uh, electronics understand uh, certain gas combination uh, in the environment or make equipment smell, if you will, or in order to make uh, 
a certain electronic uh, understand a specific gesture, combine these uh, different uh, signals, then maybe even, uh, so talking about sensor fusion, it takes artificial intelligence at the edge uh, that uh, helps, uh, so to say, through machine learning, uh, any kind of electronics to uh, then truly interpret what is meant uh, through a word, what is meant through a gesture, and tell the electronics uh, what to do next. And that's exactly the sweet spot where Infineon is meeting Syntient and where both the competencies uh, come together in a very nice way, which is creating additional value and uh, true innovation, uh, which I consider to be uh, the bridge uh, of getting uh, the analog world truly connected in a seamless manner to the digital world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kurt, can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, actually, I don't think I could have said it even any better than Andrea said. Um, I mean, we but if we if we look historically, we have we've always tried to move the real world into the visual into the virtual world in in some way. Um, often it was done with with traditional programming methods. You were write a, a a series of if then else statements, and you had a very a group of brilliant people that that tried to get. To, to understand what's actually happening in the real world and, and write a program that does those things. Um, but with the, the advent of deep learning, we were able to do things you know, very, very quickly. And it became, as opposed to just a programming problem, it became a, a QA problem where we would take a bunch of data, we would train networks, we would see what the outcomes were. And in a very short period of time, we started seeing speech recognition. And you know something that we struggled with for probably 20 years, and then over a very short period of time, maybe a couple of years, we started having things like Amazon Echoes. And, and this is the sort of thing that deep learning can bring to the table. And, and it's not just speech, it could be gestures, vibrations, you know, any type of the, the senses that, that, that the human has or even a machine has, you probably can do a better job interpreting those senses using deep learning today than you can using traditional components. And, and I think that's really where it's gonna happen is that we'll start putting that deep learning into the devices. So we remove the latency that goes to the cloud. We remove a lot of, I'd say false accepts or garbage that goes to the cloud and burning data center cycles. We can get all of the decisions made inside of the device and it could be very, very quick, very efficient and bring about types of interfaces that you know we haven't really thought of before. And I think that's really going to be the power of, of, of these sensors as well as, as the power of, of deep learning. Yeah, yeah. And, and Andreas, is there um, a difference in how much each of the sensors and, and sensors in that respect benefit from the addition of AI? Like how does it play out if you compare maybe touch versus vision and, and how important AI is to make a difference there? Uh, depending on the specific use case, uh, the answer would look uh, different. Uh, so it's uh, a function of, uh, so to say, vision computing, uh, for instance, in order to uh, make electronics understand uh, when uh, a camera is looking at a cat, uh, so that the cat is a cat and not a dog. Uh, that uh, requires a different amount of, of machine learning and then also, so to say, uh, interpretation and interpretation capability at the edge as compared to interpreting a single word like light on. Uh, that translates uh, into uh, then the differences of, uh, if you will, system partitioning, where uh, sensor and sensor data is meeting uh, artificial intelligence or deep learning capability at the edge. At the edge always means next to the sensor in order to uh, kind of uh, save out uh, and then avoid also the additional cost and latency by getting a signal uh, that is caught by a sensor into the cloud and get the answer from the cloud back. So the way how that then uh, finally looks uh, and what is chosen, either computing at the edge or computing in the cloud, pretty much then uh, depends on what you want to do. So, but in a nutshell, uh, vision computing, if you will, is in average probably more complex than uh, interpretation of single words at the edge, uh, which is again uh, less complex as compared to interpreting gestures at the edge like a hand movement uh, through a radar sensor. So talking about uh, millimeter accurate uh, gestures. So different sweet spots that do apply when you think about partitioning AI, AI at the edge uh, when they meet sensors. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is, is latency 
very much the, the the normal one sort of differentiator in making that choice or what other factors come into play? Mm, I would have said it's uh, in essence two or three factors that somebody needs to consider. Yeah, latency is always a topic and depending uh, in what uh, environment you're uh, kind of interacting with uh, whatever kind of sensors uh, you need to be aware of, is, is there a connectivity that is on top of providing a latency through the cloud, which uh, a user still would uh, uh, consider as, as meaningful. Now, so when you use your smartphone and uh, give a speech a command uh, and until the thing reacts, uh, takes uh, a second too long, you would not be too happy with regards to uh, a bad user experience and probably not do it again. So in such circumstances, uh, computing and in principle interpretation of what is said happening at the edge makes a lot of sense. Uh, typically what that happens is that uh, there is edge computing uh, next to the sensor uh, on the device which is doing a pre-filtering and pre-interpretation of data and so to say then a lighter amount of data is then sent towards the cloud for final interpretation to be sent back. Now, uh, that in essence uh, reduces the number of data rate if you will reduces or, or normally increases the, the speed but uh, even here, you have to then find sweet spot what can be truly done uh, purely at the edge and must be done for latency considerations versus what has to go through the cloud. The other topic, of course, is uh, uh, simply considerations uh, in terms of, of uh, cost and energy. So every data that is uh, kind of uh, collected by whatever sensor, be it a visual sensor, be it a radar sensor, be it a microphone, be it a gas sensor, needs to be somehow uploaded to some extent uh, to the cloud. And, and there you cause data storage space is being required. Uh, electricity and energy cost is being required in order to handle the data and interpret the data. And so here's a certain sweet spot on the cost ticket for whatever interpretation at a certain point in time uh, for a certain electronic device, which then makes uh, a system integrator like a smartphone maker consider how much interpretation is done at the edge versus how much shall be done in the cloud. Always putting the whole, uh, so to say, cost of uh, operating the entire system, putting that into account. I'd just like to add about, you know, my, my thought about deep learning at the edge and, and really, you know, deep learning and AI in general. Um, it's a, a type of technology that, that is re really never good enough. Um, I have been involved, you know, probably most of my career in, in networking type technologies where, where there's some kind of standard, whether it's a Bluetooth standard, an Ethernet standard, or, you know, some type of wireless standard. If the, if the silicon meets that standard, it's typically good enough and, and you, you go to production with it. In, in deep learning, it's, it's one of these things where you always want more processing and you always want the next fastest thing. And in deep learning at the edge, there is there's an acceptable amount of performance that you get and 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 you'll go to production with that but at the end of the day you always want more and and this is one of the reasons i think that that nvidia has been so successful coming out with new gpus is is that no matter how good of gpu they come out with the the people the deep learning practitioners are going to want more and that's that's very much the same for for processing at the edge is no matter how good a device that you come out with people are going to want more. And it's very much about, edge processing is very much about what I'd call operating in constrained environments. Things about, you know, typically it's power, it's cost, it's size, you know, depending on, on what the edge, edge product is. And if you can bring the most amount of compute, um, you can get a much better result. And I think that is, that is really where, where we started Sentient is, is that people had MCUs that could bring a small amount of, of AI compute. You, you know, you could do something running on a, on a small MCU, but if you could bring a hundred times that, you can do something much better. And then, you know, advance a couple of years later, maybe you do a 10 times like 10 times more and, and so on. And it's, it's really going to be a, a never, a never ending cycle of people wanting more and more performance, um, as opposed to many things that, that we're involved with, that if you hit the standard, it's good enough. So this is a, a never ending cycle of increased intelligence inside of these devices. And, and it's, it's actually quite exciting because, you know, you can, you can do one function, say, you know, today and say, okay, well, I'm going to have 10 times the performance next year. And, and that will allow me to have a much more seamless user interface. You know, today we have a, a laptop. I'm, I'm talking to you on a, on a MacBook. It has a camera, it has a touch screen. 
Um, it has it has a, a keyboard, um, all of which have been around for a while. And, and I think, you know, we could advance just a very short period of time in the future. And I probably will have a device that has none of those things. It probably has a camera and a screen. And I'll just talk to it and say, I want to do this or I want to do that. And I'll use gestures and it will know who I am. Um, and we're not that far away from that. And the, the more and more processing that we have at the edge will allow us to do those types of things. Um, you know, I had to learn how to use a keyboard. I had to learn how to use a mouse. But, but what if I don't? What if it just does, it, it behaves how, it, how I, a normal human would behave? And I, I think that's really going to be the power of, of deep learning. How far are we then? Like what, what are some of the breakthroughs that need to happen? Or is it only just increasing performance? Or are there some other like barriers that we need to cross maybe in, in terms of power consumption or something? I, I think you could probably do it today using you know a couple thousand watts and some GPUs. So it, it really is how do you get the performance into those constrained environments? And there's, there's a lot of deep learning researchers today that, that are operating in, in unconstrained environments, building these types of things that are running in GPUs in the cloud. And the real next step is how do I get those into devices that, that I can carry around with me? I just wanted to add one thing uh, to the equation. So talking about uh... The energy usage uh, for machine learning. Uh, so, Kurt, uh, you just hinted towards uh, latest and uh, greatest generations of uh, deep learning uh, GPUs uh, requiring 1,000 watts or more. Uh, that, in essence, uh, going forward, uh, is leading to projections that I recently have been reading about uh, that uh, the entire topic of, of data storage, machine learning, and uh, uh, data center management as a whole, so including machine learning plus then also hyperscale data centers, enterprise data centers, is about to uh, uh, develop towards uh, a need for more than 10 percentage points of electricity of the globe uh, until 2030. And if you think in that terms, so, so 10 percentage points of electricity in data centers and uh, related, uh, so to say, uh, equipment, uh, then all of, all of a sudden you need to scratch your head and say, nah, yeah, so uh, where is then and also natural barriers uh, related to scarcity of resources, uh, where are barriers uh, and also human responsibility in terms of uh, getting uh, climate change under control that uh, in essence uh, lead us uh, and, and make us and require us to work on, uh, so to say, uh, computing capabilities and AI capabilities at the edge. No? Because whatever can be offloaded with regards to data interpretation at the edge through a machine learning like it is being performed by uh, Sentient, uh, that uh, helps uh, the entire equation in order to then offload uh, the electricity uh, bill, if you will, uh, in uh, data centers to then uh, crunch the data. And uh, having said that, uh, we strongly and also uh, forward looking. Uh, are dealing with the topic of energy efficiency in uh, the holistic system. So talking about data collection in the mobile device to data management uh, in the data center, plus its uh, power flow, which has to happen under, so to say, uh, utmost uh, look and optimization point of saving energy at any point in time. And uh, I believe that's a big chance for us also to jointly work on and do something good to the planet going forward. Incredibly important topic, um, and and what I've seen from you is that that's something you're heavily in, involved in. Um, can you be specific about about like some of the solutions you're working on uh, or have been working on to uh, to make that uh, efficiency happening? Infinite has been working a lot and uh, spending a lot of uh, brain power into uh, coming up with latest and greatest uh, technology that uh, A, help to generate renewable energy. So it's about uh, electronics and semiconductors that facilitate uh, uh, windmills, if you will, or uh, wind power production and solar power production. That's one of the core areas where Infineon is working on. The other area is, uh, so to say, making uh, power semiconductors as energy efficient as possible when power and at the point where power, where power is consumed. And here a simple example is a data center. So uh, whenever data centers are starting to work, uh, each and everything is about handling a certain amount of data at a given point in time uh, at uh, the lowest uh, operational costs in the eyes of a data center uh, operator, if you will. And uh, Infineon is a specialist and uh, in the meantime, by far market leader 
uh, in that area of uh, providing power flow solutions, so which is, so to say, the entire management of getting power from the grid, convert alternating current into direct current, manage, so to say, the current flows at different, we call it point of loads, uh, in the specific server racks uh, to a degree that uh, allows, uh, so to say, uh, world's best efficiencies and therewith uh, then also saving energy. Uh, but uh, it's not about uh, energy saving only uh, while operating a data center, like I mentioned before. Uh, the equation only works uh, when uh, data that is generated in whatever kind of electronics, typically collected through sensors, the amount of data is at the device uh, and, and next to the sensor already reduced and, and sort of pre-filtered so that the actual amount of data that lands uh, to be managed in the data center is reduced to the, to the bare minimum. And, and these two things uh, are coming together uh, as an optimization point where Infineon has put a lot of effort into research and also commercialization of meaningful products in sensors and energy efficient devices. Yeah, so just to give our, our, our view of this, and, and the, the two kind of, I'd say, megatrends is, is one is, is that applications are really moving to the cloud. And, and you probably, if you're going to run an application, you're probably never going to find anything more efficient than running it in a cloud server. These things are, they're, they're very big, they're, they, they're very good at running basically one application after the other. You wanna keep them full, full the whole time, never sitting idle. The other part of the world is, is really interface. And, and you never, and you don't want your interface to go to the cloud. So interface should be where your edge computing is. It, it, and, and interface is, is, in our world, it is the, the data reduction, the first part of the compute, as well as the sensors that are interfacing to the outside world. So you have the sensor, whether it's a microphone or a gas sensor or, or vibration or, or a camera, go into a, a, a deep learning interface, which, which today, um, the interface world is really moving to deep learning. It's 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 by far the most superior way of interfacing to the right to the outside world. It might not always be, but at least it is today, and probably will be for the next ten years or so. And and you use the deep learning to reduce the data to figure out what's going on. And I'll, I'll use a an example, a pretty simple one that says, you know, if I'm looking for, um, say, a license plate, and I'm taking pictures of of every car that goes by. It's much more efficient for me to say, just, just send one message to the cloud to say, I found the license plate, than for me to send every picture to the cloud. And, and that's really where we started, is that we started where we send every picture in the cloud, or we send every voice to the cloud. So this, by moving interface across the network to the cloud, um, it's horrible. I mean, it, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're using a lot of cloud cycles that you don't need, you're using a lot of transport that you don't need, um, but in, in, if we, if we basically do all of that processing inside the device, then we don't actually have to have any of the, um, basically any of that wasted data going, going by. So, so let's just send to the cloud the bare minimum. And that's really where you get that efficiency and the efficiency, you know, just at the very bare, at the smallest amount is about a hundred X and it's going to be much more from there. So, you know, at minimum we get a hundred X with edge, edge compute, you know, we may get, you know, we may get thousands or, or more. Wow. Wow. That's, uh... There is another interesting example of uh, real life uh, energy saving by the use of uh, artificial intelligence combined with uh, sensors. Uh, using an awesome machine learning at the edge, if you will. Uh, if you look, for instance, into a, a smart building. Uh, so typically when uh, an operator smartifies a building, um, uh, the optimization point uh, with regards to heating cost, cooling cost, and effective management, for instance, of the elevators in a building. Yeah? Uh, using artificial intelligence and sensors at the right spot typically reduces the operating cost by 50 percentage points. That's what smart building operators are telling us. And where this uh, magic is pretty much coming from is uh, uh, through use of, uh, for instance, uh, presence detectors, radar sensors are used for that, 
uh, and their ability to interpret uh, whether people are in a meeting room or not. And as a function of understanding, uh, is there somebody in the meeting room uh, in this building? And if yes, uh, how many people are there? Typically, how long are they there? Under what circumstances? Uh, so to say, the data that is gathered in this context is used for learning purposes and then also doing predictive climate control. So we, we looked at it bringing machine learning from something that's basically in the cloud to, to something at the edge. And we felt that it really requires a, a different kind of processor. So we started from scratch and, and looked at how deep learning processing is different from traditional compute. And, and we really looked at three things. Um, one is, is that deep learning is, is more memory dominated than, than compute dominated. Um, the second is deep learning can benefit very, very much from parallel processing. Well, traditional compute doesn't, doesn't benefit from parallel processing that much. I and mean, we all, we all know when we buy a laptop and it goes, I go from two cores to four cores, it gets a little bit better, but it's not twice as good. But in deep learning, if I add those, those extra processors, um, I really do get a, a scale in linear, in linear manner. And then lastly, this idea of, of modest precision is, is during my lifetime, we've, our processors have gone from eight bits to 16 bits to 32 to 64 and so on. But with deep learning, I can do things that are sub eight bits. So this combination of focusing on memory, focusing on parallel processing and focusing on modest precision allowed us to increase the, the amount of performance that you can get in any given power envelope by about 200 X versus what's out there today. Um, if, if I refer the, the, the listeners today to our blog, we have a, a blog comparing a typical MCU with, with our neural processor and showing the, the performance measurements between the two. But when you get 200x performance increase, you can start doing interesting things. So we went to being able to just look at things like wake words to wake words and commands and then to gestures, then to event detection, whether it's glass, glass breaking or pressure or things like that. And we started being able to do these types of, of these measurements. And then we had customers come to us and say, you know, well, that's very interesting. We're, we're, we like what you're doing, but I'd like it to run on a coin cell for a year. So we start looking at those sort of things of how can I do always on deep learning processing, which previously would take, you know, several milliwatts, you know, 10 plus, maybe a hundred milliwatts, maybe a watt, even in some cases and run that in then the, the microwatt type range. And, and that's really where we're, we're trying to go. We're actually, we're, we're there today is that we can run a lot of these things on a coin cell for a year or, or more. And, and that can bring deep learning to really any environment. I mean, to, today, even the smallest systems can, can bring deep learning using, using sentient devices. So I wanna thank everyone for listening watching through this conversation. I've learned a ton, uh, it's been super interesting. Um, I'm gonna read more into the topics that uh, uh, Kurt and Andreas have talked about today. Um, there are gonna be more conversations like these, so please follow Sentient, follow Revolver on your favorite channel, and you'll know for sure when the next one's coming up. And that's a wrap for today, thank you.